Hi everyone, um, I am Costantina Zanu and I am an assistant professor of uh, Italian and Mediterranean history here at Columbia University. And this is the last uh, of uh, our um, events of the Italian and Mediterranean Colloquium uh, this semester, which I co-organized with Pier Mattia Tomasino in the Italian department and the European Institute. Um, so uh, today I will, uh, I will first present I, our two speakers and then tell you some uh, things about the technicalities uh, of the event. So um, Elena Bakin, we are happy to have her with us, um, is a Marie Curie Global Fellow uh, between Cat Foscari in Venice and here Columbia University. Um, and she's actually here in New York for this semester. Elena has held visiting positions at the University of California, San Diego, at Oxford University, at New York University. She has also uh, worked as a lecturer at Queen Mary University of London and taught at the universities of Padova and Bologna. So quite an array of uh, short-term positions. Um, Elena is a historian of the long 19th century. Her research focuses on the transnational history of nationalism, political mobilization and the public sphere on exile and uh, the connections between religious and political identities with a special emphasis on Italy. She's the author already of two books in Italian. Uh, the first one it's called Italophilia, Opinione Pubblica Britannica e Risorgimento Italiano 1847-64. to uh, 64. Uh, So it was published in 2014. It's actually uh, about the British public opinion on the Risorgimento. And the second book is called uh, 24 Maggio 1915, uh, 24 May 1915, which means, which is the day Italy entered the First World War. So it's a micro history of uh, the Great War in Italy. Um, and she has also authored several articles in English and Italian. Elena, Elena's talk today uh, is related to your current uh, book project, which explores the role and transnational relevance of political prisoners in 19th century Italy. Um, on the other hand, Mark Mazauer uh, needs little introduction. I believe he is the Ira uh, Wallach Professor of History here at Columbia University and a world uh, renowned historian. His latest book project, I believe now in press, Mark is a history of the Greek Revolution. Is it in press, Mark? I cannot hear you. Yes? Yes, it is. Can you tell us the title? Uh, the Greek Revolution. Ah, simple and good. Okay, great. So uh, thank you for being with us, Mark, and um, the practicalities. So we, Elena is gonna talk for like no more than 25 minutes, Elena, right? like 25 minutes, half an hour maximum. Uh, Mark will comment uh, no more than, you know, five, 10 minutes. And then we'll open the discussion, the floor to the discussion. You can either take uh, uh, the microphone and pose your question or write your question in the chat. And I believe that the event will not uh, take more than one hour and, uh, and uh, 15 minutes or so. Okay, so the floor is yours, Elena. Hi, thanks, Costantina. And first of all, let me say how delighted I am to be here. And it's a real honor to share my work with such an exceptional audience of scholars. Let me share my screen and we can start. So I will start my talk with a boat trip and some portraits. On the 1st of June, 1832, the Austrian steamer Medea sailed from Venice to Toulon, France. On board, there were 77 insurgents from the Duchy of Modena, who had just been released from an Austrian prison. The release was actually presented by the French press and in the Parliament of Paris as a concession and as an allowance to French pressure. While in captivity, Antonio Zanolini drew this amazing portrait of his fellow detainees. But who were these prisoners? 
why had they been imprisoned and why did France intervene on their behalf and welcome them? At the beginning of 1831, this insurgent had tried to create an independent kingdom at the center of the Italian peninsula in the territories of the Duchy of Modena and the Papal State. However, a Nostrum armed intervention stopped their attempt and after the capitulation at the end of May, 1831, while they were going to exile in Corfu, two Austrian boats arrested and imprisoned them in Venice. Their story and the commitment of French politicians on their behalf, along with sensibility toward other Italian political convicts spread at the same time, bring to the fore the emergence and the impact of a reconfiguration of political crime taking place during the first decades of the 19th century in liberal milieu, as, as well as the transnational role and relevance of political prisoners already in the 1800s. Scholars disagree both on the definition of political prisoners and on the timing and causes of the rise of their representation. According to some, political inmates emerged as a subject at the end of the 19th century, becoming an instrument of political activity. Others assert that political imprisonment was a major feature of the 20th century, and that before this period, the prisoner was an obscure subject. The disagreement on the rise of the question of political detainees also influenced the idea that political convicts became an international concern only after the Second World War when a shift in attitudes to human rights and to government mistreatment of its own citizens took place. This talk aims to discuss and question the idea that political prisoners did not emerge as political figures with an international and a transnational dimension until the 20th century. First, I argue that a new conception of political crime which still influences our own understanding of the phenomenon emerged within the liberal society during the restoration. Second, this new notion of political crime promoted an international mobilization and commitment to political convicts. In a complex and often contradictory dialectic between the security of the state and the political rights of the individuals. Questions such as who is a political prisoner? Which penalties could be applied to political crimes? How should a political convict be treated in prison? When is it legitimate to contest and challenge government? That we're going to discuss in this, in this talk are still relevant nowadays. For example, when in October 2019, a Spanish court sentenced the Catalonian independence leaders leaders to, prize, to prison for sedition, in Barcelona, their supporters declared them to be presos politicos, political prisoners, while the Spanish prime minister, Pedro Sanchez, stated, no hay presos politico en España, and declared them to simply be politicians in prison. A few weeks ago, Amnesty International declared that Alexei Navalny, who is serving a two and a half year sentence in a Russian prison could not be considered a prisoner of conscience since he incited discrimination and violence. Navalny is currently on a hunger strike declaring having been tortured through sleep dep deprivation while in prison. Thus, most of the issues that we're going to analyze from an historical perspective are still are still relevant today. Our setting will be France in the 1830s. After the July Revolution, King uh, Charles X was overthrown accused of, because he was accused of the violation of the constitution. After three days of protest, his cousin, Louis Philippe, was proclaimed by the Chamber of Deputy, King of the French, and agreed to rule as a constitutional monarch. In this context, I will analyze theoretical debates on political crime and the perception 
of Italian political prisoners. Our actors are going to be Francois Guizot, the theorist and leading politician of the July monarchy, Piero Maroncelli and Silvio Pellico, probably the most famous prisoners of the Italian Risorgimento. In this engraving, Pellico was holding Maroncelli while the barber was going to amputate his leg in prison. And the modernist prisoners, who I spoke of at the beginning of this talk. A recruiting actor will be General Lafayette. Notorious for his participation in the American Revolution, he represented the, the left in the French parliament and had spent five years in prison in the 1790s. So even if political crime is as old as politics, in the French charter of, of 1830, the term political offenses, the lit politique, appeared for the first time in a constitution. The 1830 charter was a revised version designed by Francois Guizot and Victor de Broglie of the 1814 constitution. And even if the paternity of the article 69 dealing with political felony is uncertain, Guizot had been reflecting on political crime for a while. At the beginning of the 1820s, when he was excluded from the Restoration Administration for his liberal ideas, Guizot published two pamphlets that he defined as opposition writings. The Conspiration et de la Justice Politique, issued in September 1821, et de la peine de mort en matière politique, published in 1822. In this pamphlet, he underlined the moral aspects and the relativity of political crime and declared it to be less serious than common offenses. In 1820s France, conspiracies and political trials were quickly escalating. Later on, in his memoir, Guizot declared to have perceived these plots as ill-funded and badly conducted and to have been moved by men who sacrificed their souls and lives for a cause, quote, they believed to be good. Briefly, in this pamphlet, Guizot denounced how justice was under the yoke of politics and how a government incapable of ruling the society both created discontent and at the same time punished this discontent instead of introducing reforms. Therefore, protests and conspiracies might be the proof of, quote, the bad state of the society or the bad behavior of the government. Moreover, Guizot aimed to prove that the death penalty in politics was inefficient, useless, and even dangerous because the death penalty did not prevent plotting did not guarantee social order and incremented the hatred for the government. In his reflection, Guizot combined the doctrine of Bentham on the social utility of the repression with the idea elaborated by Kant of a moral fundament of the right to punish. Guizot stated that the immorality of political crime is neither as clear nor as immutable as that of common private crime. It varies according to the times, the events, the laws, and the merits of the government. The definition of political crime was thus relativized according to the political regime and could also assume innocence and merit. This new notion of political crime was the product of new concepts on right and politics. If the Enlightenment promoted a reflection on crimes, rights, and punishment, with the French Revolution, the abstract entity of the state substituted the prince as the holder of power, whose legitimacy was no longer perceived as absolute and unconditional. Moreover, a distinction between the internal and the external security of the state was introduced. This distinction referred to felonies against the form of governments and institution 
or crimes against the existence of the state. Additionally, in this phase, revolutions became a means to access power. This overall, the struggle is no longer between men, but between systems of government. Political dissidents not only express views that challenge the policies of the monarchy, but were rivals for power, proposing alternatives form of government. Furthermore, the spread of political ideas had also changed the social composition of political mobilization. This approach laid the foundation for the July monarchy. Gizot declared in, parla in parliament that the July revolution was a new era based on political legitimacy and that, quote, the nation has the right to resist an oppressive government. So from the ruins of the ancien regime, on the one hand, among liberal cohort, rose the idea of a preferential treatment, although limited and contradictory, granted to political prisoners by the state. On the other hand, from the point of view of the legitimate authorities, political offenders became enemies of the state. They were considered more guilty than common criminals because they placed themselves above the law by denying the validity of the state in the name of a supposed higher ethic. For example, Pellico declared that when Lafayette was in prison in Olmutz in the 1790s, quote, they would not have dared to treat him as a convict. But in the 1820s, when Pellico and Maroncelli were in prison, things had changed and the persecution of crimes against the state appeared vital for the survival of the monarchy and the undermining of public order justified harsh repressive measures. Thus, the changes that took place in politics influenced not only the treatment of political convicts because authoritarian governments perceived dissident as a threat to their power and legitimacy, but also influenced a liberal commitment to and mobilization of four the Chinese and foreign detainees in particular, as my research on the Italian case demonstrate. In this context, I argue, and this is my second point, that as well as exiles, also political prisoners emerged as transnational actors of the Risorgimento, and they played a role not only among public opinions, but also in the diplomatic world. Furthermore, they were aware of this role and try to exploit it with a clear political and media strategy. So if political crime was perceived as a relative and vague concept, political liberalism took advantage of this to represent political criminals as protagonists of a fight against oppression in non-liberal countries, or in other words, as noble conspirators confronting despotism. On this basis, in March 1833, Guizot, who was at that time Minister of Education, granted Piero Maroncelli a subsidy for his contribution to letters and arts. And here we have our second protagonist. Along with Pellico, Maroncelli was arrested in fall 1820 for conspiracy and condemned to death and then to 20 years of harsh prison in the Spielberg fortress. The Spielberg was a prison in Brno, nowadays Czech Republic, which became in those decades the emblem of Austrian despotism. At the Spielberg, Maroncelli shared the cell with Pellico before being released in August 1830. Just a few months later, Maroncelli was in Paris. At the end of February 1831, General Lafayette, after encountering Maroncelli, presented in Parliament the issues of the Spielberg's prisoners, defined as victims of absolute power. Lafayette stressed how they were mixed with common criminals and treated badly. In particular, he emphasized how they lost their names, wore prisoners' robes, were chained ate poorly and did not have access to books 
or lights. A few days later, Lafayette introduced Maroncelli to the king and queen of France. During this meeting, Maroncelli pleaded to the king to intervene on behalf of his poor companions still in prison. The French press began presenting Maroncelli to the public, and at the end of March 1831, from articles in Le Figaro, we learned that the fundraising campaign was organized to support the publication of an account of Maroncelli's captivity. Subscriptions were quickly collected, even the Queen of France contributed, and a plan for the book was circulated. It was the Liberal Front who asked Maroncelli to write this memoir of his imprisonment to be published in France. They were willing to use it as a political weapon against Austrian authoritarian policies. But Maroncelli himself had a clear political and media strategy. On the one hand, he wanted to earn some money. On the other, he aimed to mobilize the French politicians for the cause of the detainees imprisoned in the Habsburg, in the Habsburg Empire. But Maroncelli book, Maroncelli's book was never published and it was replaced by Pellico's My Prisons, which became a bestseller. Pellico actually intervened and strongly advised against Maroncelli's publication, claiming it would be harmful for people who were still imprisoned fearing Austrian reaction and warning Maroncelli that the liberals of France were taking advantage of him. However, in November 1832, Silvio Pellico published his own book and in April 1833, the French translation was already available. The news of Pellico's memoir was unexpected for Maroncelli, who thereafter simply was simply represented by the French press as the friend of poor Silvio. In summer 1833, Maroncelli printed his additions to my prisons and left soon after for the United States. But when Maroncelli first arrived in France at the beginning of 1831, another drama was sparked. This time it concerned modernist subject kept in Austrian prison in Venice. In the summer of 1831, Carlo Peppoli, another Italian refugee living in Paris, who was also imprisoned for a while by Austrian authorities, urged Maroncelli to pressure his powerful and liberal friends for such a holy and magnanimous case, meaning the prisoners from Modena. And here, we have our third protagonist. The arrest of the insurgent from central Italy in March 1831 by Austrian authorities was discussed by politicians and diplomats across borders. Their stories circulating in the press who identified them as the prisoners of Venice. From a diplomatic point of view, the French ambassadors in Rome and Vienna pressed pre Prince Metternich, the Austrian chancellor, for the release of the prisoners. Also, Louis Philippe, the King of France, wrote a letter in June 1831 to the Emperor of Austria, asking him to pardon General Zucchi, one of the leaders of the rebels, who was an Austrian subject, accused of desertion. So, intervention concerned not only foreign prisoners, detained by Austria, but also Austrian subject. General Lafayette became one of the major supporters of their release, presenting their case in parliament several times. For example, in October 1831, while defining the Austrian seizure of their boat and the arrest of the rebels as an act of piracy, Lafayette remember other Italian convicts, in particular, the mother of Pallavicini who died in pain while her son was imprisoned and the detainees of the Spielberg for whom chaining, quote, was worse than death. Other Italian refugees intervened on behalf of the 1831 insurgent. 
Enrico Misley, who had also been involved in the modernist insurrection, represented two petitions to the French parliament. He appealed for a human intervention of France and for the application of the law of nation, the law of nature and of humanity. This mobilization was actually based on three main points. And I have found that the international commitment to other Italian political prisoners was mostly founded on the same element. First, we have a humanitarian narrative. For example, the French ambassador talked about the interest of humanity. And in parliament, Lamarck spoke about moral and physical tortures, about illnesses, about irons, about food deprivation. Two prisoners actually died in jail. One was Enrichetta Bassoli Castiglioni, who was also pregnant. These courses stress the pain inflicted on the prisoners, who, we should not forget, were men and women of the upper and middle classes, and thus share the same cultural and social status of those, of those pressing for their release. Second, there was a reference to international law, to the droit de jeune. In this case, Austrian arrested citizens of another country, of Bondena, for an insurrection that took place abroad. But intervention also dealt with foreign subjects imprisoned by their own state. International law was not a precise matter at that time. However, it was meant to guarantee the post-Napoleonic system, and in particular, the security and interest of the so-called civilized state. And in this case, the appeal, it, the appeal to it was constant. Any intervention on behalf of foreign prisoners asking for their release, for amnesties, or for the improvement of their living conditions was perceived as an effort to maintain the stability of Europe and prevent the outbreak of revolutions. It thus implied the disrespect of the principle of non-intervention, not only to suppress revolution, but also to promote reform and reform concerning political prisoners in particular. Finally, mobilization implied the definition of, of the notion of political crime and the legitimacy of insurrection against authoritarian government we have previously discussed. Lamarck, for example, compared the stories of these modernist rebels to French patriots who had been persecuted, exiled, and imprisoned for the freedom of their country and stressed how the current French parliament was composed of men named after a revolution. Lafayette declared that French member of parliaments would be called rebels similarly to the modernist insurgent who were imprisoned. So this case was clearly linked to foreign relations. However, I'd like to stress how the use of a humanitarian language and the emphasis on harsh treatment were not only an important signal of a new sensibility uh, toward political uh, convicts, by, but also helped strengthen public commitment. The support for Italian detainees was part of a liberal sensibility that perceived political criminals as protagonists in a fight against oppression. But in the aftermath of its foundation, the July monarchy had to deal with its own political dissidents. First and foremost, the ministers of the previous Bourbon government. Let us go back for a moment to Guizot. In November, 1830, he, uh, he resigned from the executive after having declared that he was in favor of the abolition of the death penalty for these ex-ministers to avoid their transformation into martyrs. However, the government supported a milder solution and mobs asked for their death, considering this clemency a treason to the revolution. In France, the abolition of the death penalty for political felonies had to be postponed until 1848. However, the new notion of political crime had an impact on the legislation. A reform of the penal code in April 1832 
42, abolish the confiscation of assets for political crime, reduce the number of crimes for the application of the death penalty, and forbade the punishment of hard labor. Moreover, in 1834, political crime was declared as a crime of opinion. Convicts were entitled to a special treatment in St. Pelagie and in other prisons, uh, included a better diet and the freedom from compulsory work. Pierre Zanvalon affirms that the first half of the 19th century was a laboratory of the modern political thought. What I have discussed here is that the July Revolution was a watershed for political crime, as it also was for asylum, as other research has demonstrated. Political imprisonment and asylum were strictly connected, leading to a transnational sensibility and commitment on behalf of people persecuted for political reasons. So, from the ruins of the Ancien Regime rose both a harsher treatment of political felonies and a new elaboration of the concept of political crime, transforming political prisoners into emblems of freedom and introducing a relative notion of political crime, which is still relevant nowadays. I have focused on the 1830s, but this presentation is part of a broader work on political prisoners as actors of the 19th century and of the Italian movement in particular. Many other cases of diplomatic and transnational commitment for foreign political convicts can be enlisted in the 19th century. For example, if I return to rebels of the 1830, 62 Roman insurgents arrested in Rome in 1830 and imprisoned in, Civic, in Civita Castellana had been transported to Brazil in February 1837. And the companions of Pellico and Maroncelli who were still in prison in the Spielberg in October 1836 had been transported for life to America. One of them, Confalonieri, declared the welcome he received in New York as oppressive. But this is another story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. You can stop sharing. Wonderful. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Elena, for this really, uh, wow, very rich uh, uh, research, very interesting, thought-provoking, but also very well and clearly performed. Uh, I will give the word now to Mark Mazauer for his comment. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I found this fascinating. Um, very thought-provoking, thank you, and uh, especially coming at it from the 1820s, which is where I've been immersed for a while now. Um, so I, I just want to pick up on a number of, of general points, uh, maybe as a way of kicking off a discussion. I don't have a great deal to say. Um, so this seemed to me to be part of a longer story of 19th century political crime and political prisoners. And um, whatever the tendency to assume lots of things started in the era of the two world wars, I think it's, it's pretty clear this is a 19th century story. Um, and uh, the uh, enormous interest aroused in England and elsewhere at, at the status of political prisoners in Russia in the 1890s, for instance, is not the beginning of this story by any means. I think you've brought us much closer to the beginning of the story in very interesting ways. So uh, it, uh, my questions or thoughts are designed to uh, elicit more from you about exactly what happens in the 1830s and where, whether there's something specific happening in this moment of the restoration happening in France, uh, in particular whether Orleanist liberalism uh, occupies a very specific role in the post-Bonaparte era. Um, the first thing that struck me was the sympathy that Guizot expressed for the idea of conspiracy in the 1820s. That seemed to me enormously important, that, that, that uh, um, it grows out of this notion of the justified conspiracy. Um, 
and the, the, the thing that comes along with that is a kind of a very sharp historical sense, a, a sense of the historical sociology of governments, uh, um, that uh, uh, the, the uh, morality of a particular crime depends on the times. I thought that was very characteristic of the 1820s and the 1830s, and I would like to hear more about that, that you're now, a, 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 there is emerging a philosophy of legitimacy that has this strong historical sense, and that's what, that's what perhaps what drives the relativism. Um, and the third thing about the 1820s, of course, it, it, it is, and connected with conspiracy, is, is the fight against oppression, which is the other side of the theory of legitimacy, that certain kinds of government are, um, uh, it is permitted or it is in fact mandated to, to struggle against because they are oppressive. And um, you'll forgive me if I can't help dragging the, the Greek War of Independence into this, but it seemed to me so bound up with, with everything that you're talking about, because um, you could start off with the very beginning, with the, the rising of the friendly society, the Philiketeri in the spring of 1821, which ends with what? It, it ends with its leader, uh, Alexandros Ypsilantis, fleeing into Austria, and being imprisoned for the next seven years in a fortress. One might have asked on what grounds, and actually it would be very interesting to know uh, what the discussion was about the continued detention of Ypsilantis. Was he considered at the time to be a political prisoner? I, I don't think that that category was really the operative one, um, but you can see an anxiety, you can see a concern that this kind of state power could be used in this kind of way. Um, interestingly, the Russians had originally had the desire to just um, usher him onto a ship in Hamburg and get him to sail to the United States, which was the alternative to the idea of developing a theory of the political prisoner, just leave, leave them all to go to the United States and, and Metternich wouldn't wouldn't have anything of it. But there seems to me a very important, uh, th so that's indicative of the, obviously of the lack of sympathy of mainstream diplomats in the early 1820s with the Greeks. And conversely, the emergence of this milieu that surely is going to be important for you of sympathy for the Greeks amongst the Philhellenes, which becomes mainstream around 1825 or 1826, I think. And, and in the Orleanist circles, and he's very involved, Louis Philippe is very involved in those circles. And so the, the, the idea that somebody like Chateaubriand could be um, formulating a theory of legitimacy that in fact explains why the Greeks are justified in rising up against despotism, because the Ottoman Sultan is a despot, um, shows you how far this attitude has already permeated uh, in pre-Orleanist France uh, by 1826, 1827. Um, and so I think it would be interesting to hear a little more about both about those debates of the 1820s um, and, and, and the way they crystallize around two sets of oppressive rulers, the Bourbons for one. Uh, I do think there's a lot to be said about the liberal image of the Bourbons. Um, and, and the other, the Ottoman Sultan, if he, if he comes in. And it's very striking to me that, um, uh, in 1831, when Capodistrius is assassinated in Nafplion, um, one of his assassins, the one who survives, Yorgos Mavromikalis, when he is arrested, he says that this was a political crime. And I want to be tried by the National Assembly. And he doesn't get anywhere. But uh, it's hard for me to think of an earlier precedent in Greece for the use of that, it would be interesting to talk about it, but, but the, the, he is familiar with that and he's very close to French circles. Um, so that, that, that was interesting to me, uh, um, just, that's just a parenthesis. Um, the second just observations about, I'd like to hear more about this, the, the, this articulation of political crime, of the meaning of political crime, of its relationship to legitimacy, but it, it also seemed to me to be related to something else that I'd like to hear more about, and that's opinion. 
there was a lot of discussion amongst political commentators in the 1820s about the emergence of opinion, usually in the form of public opinion, uh, but opinion as a good, opinion as a social uh, virtue. You wanted a society in which there was a multiplicity of opinions. That was a good thing. And so what is, what is happening is an older crime that was very familiar in the Republican vocabulary as tyrannicide. Uh, has been um, possibly, uh, just to throw this out as an idea, um, has been um, modified and, and modernized in the 1820s around the notion of an opinion, a legitimate, the expression of a legitimate opinion that should be treated as, as such. And that I think there's also something in there lurking in there from what you said about fanaticism and um, the reason to avoid the death penalty is, is opinions are legitimate, but certain kinds of actions are not. And you don't want to create fanatics. Uh, the death penalty fanaticizes. So there is, there is some liberalism of the middle here that's being articulated, I think, through, through the notion of the political crime. And then the last thing was to do with this, um, the memoir, the story, the public sphere, um, I couldn't help noticing in one of the first articles that you gave us to read that we are told that when you entered the Austrian fortress, one of the first things that happened to the political prisoner was that he was deprived of his name. And, and I was thinking about that and, and about the propensity to tell your story, to publish your life, uh, this sort of competition between the two men of who was going to get their life in print. Uh, who was going to be remembered. Um, autobiography and testimony is essential parts of that because the, the and this, is, the, the, this takes us up to Amnesty International because the liberal attack on absolutism um, becomes um, a question of defending very identifiable individuals. It's not a system, it's this individual or that individual who tells this or that shocking story appears to be there in the 1830s. And I thought that was extremely interesting. Um, and I, uh, you know, Dumas and the, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, as uh, all these figures who are, who the power and terror comes from being deprived of a name and not knowing what their name was. That, that, that was something interesting there. but. I wondered ultimately, coming back to the 1830s and then I'll stop, whether in the 1830s in a sense, this kind of thinking is not already a little on the back foot and one doesn't want to be too teleological about it. In other words, it may well be that you're right, that as an immediate outgrowth of the revolution of 1830, you get the first articulation of the notion of political crime. But it seemed to me that if you were a political radical, you were facing another, decade and more of a fairly miserable existence in which in fact the absolutist regimes were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and so I come back to where I started, which was asking you to think about this in the long run of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Elena, I think that you will have many things to respond, so I'll give you the word. Thank you for this very interesting comments. Uh, I'm not sure that I will be able to reply to all of them because I haven't, I mean, I've been working on this topic for a while, but I'm not, a, I've considered all these aspects. So uh, what I think is interesting is that uh, I think that in the 1820s, actually uh, Guizot was able to um, redefine the notion of political crime, but his definition uh, actually had a long-term impact. And the, uh, the notion of political crime was based, according to Guizot, uh, on its relativity, and it was actually a vague and relative concept. And because of this, it actually can be used as a political weapon, uh, meaning uh, <laughs> political criminals are just the people that we decide to define them to define as political criminals, since uh, Guizot actually said the plotters of the 1820s actually were ill-funded and they were badly conducted. They, they didn't have actually the power to do it. So, uh, but their actually um, 
uh, their uh, conviction and their um, death, actually their execution, actually uh, transformed them in martyrs. So they became emblem of their uh, of their case. But if we go back to the, I mean, the end of the uh, 19th century, the same concept was actually, um, I mean, if we think about uh, social societies or the anarch anarch anarchists, they actually refused to apply the notion of political crimes. Many European governments, they refused to apply the notion of political crime to this social crime. And they applied some such as uh, exceptional um, legislation. So uh, it became, I mean, this, uh, the notion of the the notion of political crime remain actually vague uh, throughout the century and was actually uh, used uh, according to the interest of those who are applying it. And but what is interesting that, for example, in the 1830s, after the constitution in France, they have tried to identify in the penal code of uh, 1810, which were the crimes that actually could be defined as political crimes. And there was such a huge debate in the Chamber of Affairs and the Chamber of Deputies. And actually they were, they actually came out some, with some articles from the penal code. They said, but that's not possible to identify all political crimes because actually it, it depends on the government, it depends on the time. So the relativity was actually the, uh, the main characteristic of it. And I think it still remains the main characteristic of uh, political crime if we think about uh, nowadays, it depends on the point of view of who is uh, actually uh, trying to challenge a government or if the government is legitimate or not. So that's, I think, the, uh, the constant uh, feature of uh, political crime. And um, uh, another things connected with the idea of the public uh, opinion, Guizot actually was uh, proposing in his uh, writings, actually in some notes that I found in his uh, archive in uh, Paris, he was actually proposing the jury for political crime, uh, saying that um, a jury that was based on uh, public opinion was actually the only one that was able to um, uh, to judge uh, political uh, criminals, since uh, their um, their crime cannot be judged by a judge that is connected with the government, so only the public opinion, so the jury was actually allowed to uh, to judge it and to put them on uh, trials. Uh, something else about the names and the category. I think that from the point of view of the political prisoners, the recognition of their status of political prisoners was actually a, a core uh, element. If we think about the uh, suffragette in Britain, but also these uh, prisoners, Italian prisoners uh, during the, uh, the Risorgimento, actually what they wanted was to be recognized as political prisoners and to have their status recognized meant to have also a legitimization of their own uh, fight on their own struggle, uh, if not by the government, at least by the public uh, opinion. And this recognition uh, went, uh, meant a better treatment, meant to be separated from common criminals, meant to wear their own dresses, not the prisoner's robe, uh, to avoid being, uh, you know, at their mm, their haircuts or you know uh, all those uh, elements that were strictly connected with common uh, prisoners so they became emblems emblems but they wanted also to maintain their uh, identity and they were actually fighting to have a preferential uh, lenient treatment compared to other common uh, criminals because the, i mean at least the, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century i think up to the last decades uh, their status was actually a relevant element. If we think about uh, Gladstone, when he denounced the treatment of political prisoners in Naples, he actually declared that Poirier and Settembrini, these Neapolitan prisoners, could be compared to uh, the member of parliaments of Britain, to Lord Aberdeen or uh, Lord Graham. So it was actually a question of status, not only of uh, uh, political opinion. And so. I mean, radicals were not actually allowed, or for example, Mazzini, to have this special treatment. It was relative and vague, as we said at the beginning. So it depends on who actually was uh, 
challenging the government. Thank you. I don't know if there is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you will have the chance uh, even further. I think we can open uh, to other questions and then we can come back to some of these uh, points. Uh, I will give the word to Nikolai Mikhail, who has some questions and points. Hi, Nikolai. Thank you very much. I would like to congratulate uh, Elena Bakin for uh, for a wonderful presentation. I I uh, discovered a lot uh, related uh, also to my research on uh, 1848 uh, Romanian revolutionary experience, and uh, also because I studied this uh, this question of the criminalization of those who participated to this revolution by the Russian, and especially the Russian intervention in uh, in the Romanian principalities at the end of 1848. And I want to uh, come back also to one of Professor Mark Mazur's affirmation regarding this, uh, uh, this sympathy who arose in, in Europe in 19th century, maybe starting with the Greeks, with the Greeks, but also uh, then in the 30s, uh, 80, 48 uh, years uh, related to the Polish, a lot of uh, Polish revolutionaries who coming in France also to the Italians, also to the Romanians. And I want to ask uh, Elena Bakin uh, if, um, if she thinks that a lot of this um, popularization of these cases of political prisoners, uh, exilites, it's related also to this power of transnational networks of journalists, diplomats, uh, revolutionary militaries, uh, uh, they, they work together the uh, a lot of these central and eastern uh, europeans know how to appeal to the french diplomats uh, british uh, english diplomats also to all italian uh, uh, hungarian uh, polish revolutionaries and to work together to promote their cause and defend also their their uh, um, how to say uh, uh, repre um, uh, exilize their revolutionary uh, persons, but I think also I, I see this in the case of the Russia. When uh, Russia uh, um, come uh, uh, and have a powerful uh, intervention in the Romanian principalities, those who are uh, kept and and uh, and prosecuted, I I think that uh, there is a very um, how to say uh, delicate situation because as in the case of the Italian uh, uh, accused by the Austrians. It, there is the uh, peril to transform the Italians in the martyrs. It's the same case for the Russia, and the Russia has already the experience of the December uh, revolutionaries in his case. So uh, Russia acting very carefully. So, for example, I have a case here, Kostakia Zaman, with a Romanian revolutionary, uh, a low aristocrat, who will be sent to Siberia, and he is accused, not of political theory, but if I could quote, the to be complicated in the revolution in the highest degree. So this is the this is the how to say the, the accusation. And for this accusation, he will be sent in Siberia. But most of the Romanian revolutionaries are not to be sent in, in Siberia. And this is the second question I want to 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 come to Elena Bakin and to ask. There is a rela a straight relation between. Um, political uh, political prisoner criminalization of uh, of revolution uh, as a political fact and have a special space of that uh, prisons castle or in the case of the Russian is already uh, famous Siberia and uh, the uh, to be sent in Siberia this will be also very powerful in the 20 centuries we have a lot of cases in Eastern Europe so prisoner political prisoner who sent were sent in Siberia. And this is already related to uh, uh, how to say uh, um, um, powerful uh, culpabilization, and uh, uh, if you act po for political way, you risk to 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 have a very uh, powerful uh, um, uh, how to say repression related to these spaces of uh, with with all of their origin. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank for you, my Thank you so much. Uh, let me just say that you can write in the chat if you want to ask a question or just raise your virtual hand. Uh, in the meantime, Elena, you can address some of these uh, issues if you want. So, thank you, Nicolai. It was very interesting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, there were uh, these networks of liberals or 
let's say, transnational networks of liberals or radicals that actually were promoting this campaign toward the foreign political uh, prisoners. Uh, it was not just an Italian case. For example, if we think about 1848 in uh, Germany, we got the people that were asking for the release of um, the Polish prisoners that were kept, were in prison there. So it was really a transnational um, movement. And there were actually connection between these uh, exiles. And to some extent, some of these prisoners, whenever they were released, they actually became exiled. So also the connection between the figure of the political criminal and that of the exile are strictly uh, connected. And uh, for example, there were these networks that for example, Maurizio Isabella uh, has been studying uh, for a while were so relevant that for example, I can find the letters of uh, pre political prisoners from Naples while they were in prison in the archive of Gladstone in the foreign office, the British foreign office in the Ministère des Affaires étrangères in Paris. So there was really a, a circulation of um, information. And also when they were in prison, they were actually in contact with this transnational um, network that were helping them legally and not legally, because I mean, sometimes they try also to organize some um, escaping that were uh, not legal. And then for the idea of the relationship between uh, prisons and transportation. Even if uh, Italy, Italian states during the Risorgimento didn't have actually colonies of overseas or overseas territories, they actually not only imprisoned uh, political uh, criminals, but also try to transport them to deport them in foreign countries. And that's interesting. When the um, when a political convict was actually kept in prison for too long. Uh, for example, the case of uh, um, Maroncelli, they stayed in prison for 10 years. That actually became an international concern. There were actually uh, some pressure also among the public uh, opinion. Uh, we got Stendhal, we got other Italian poets that were actually pressing, uh, we got Byron pressing for their uh, release. So when they were kept in prison for too long, either there were amnesties but amnesties were considered quite of dangerous because they uh, they created they recreated a, a problem of social order because actually they return in the society. Many times, Italian states actually tried to transport them abroad. For example, the companion of Pellico and Maroncelli, Confalonieri, Foresti, and others were actually sent to the United States. So Italy didn't didn't have Siberia. Italian state didn't have Siberia, but actually uh, sent them abroad. Or, for example, the Papal States sent them in Brazil. Naples tried to send them in a penal colony in South America, in Argentina. So they were trying to get rid of them because keeping them in prison actually was dangerous. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Phil, Phil Cook? Right, yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, brilliant. Yes, yes, thanks very much, um, Ellen. It was a very interesting talk. I mean, I, I, you discussed these issues um, with me in, in the past. So I already had some idea of what, what, you, what you were going to say, but um, I think you, you really managed to get over in a very, very clear fashion, you know, you, what, what your ideas and what your thinking is at, at, at present. I, I suppose I've got two questions. Okay, one is, is Gizo, And um, I mean, I'm interested in, in, in him and, and um, and whether you know anything about how his um, his ideas and his sympathy for the Italian situation, for the Italian political prisoners, how his ideas kind of travel back to Italy, are there any any kind of ways in 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 which his work is is translated, for example? I mean, I can partially answer my question because I've already started looking at it for you, um, and and that his <laughs> that his um, so the, the, the treatise on the on the death penalty is translated into, into Italian in 1840, in 1848, it seems to be in Naples. So it seems to circulate in the south um, rather than in, in other bits of Italy. So if you know anything about, about how Gizzo's ideas and his support for, for the Italian cause gets into Italy, I'd be grateful to, to hear them. And, um, and again, I think it's connected with Gizzo, but it also follows on from, uh, from what Nikolai was saying. He mentioned um, the Decemberist revolt uh, in, um, in Russia. It's 18, 
25, I think it is. And I, I just wondered the, the, the extent to which the December result, the revolt then resonated uh, outside of, um, of Russia into, into France. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that Guizot me mentions it and was tied up with the discussions. But the extent to which the Decembrist revolt then also has an impact on the way that Italian revolutionaries are, are thinking. Because it seems to me that for the 1820s, it's the key, it's the, it's the, it's the key moment, isn't it? The key, the, the international revolt par excellence, it, it, it seems to me, in the way that it resonates. So I wonder whether you, you're able to tell us something about that, um, about that and its impact on, on Italy. If you can, I'm sorry, that's a rather demanding set of questions, but you know, I'm sure you're capable of responding. Um, Elena, do you want to gather uh, more questions? Uh, perhaps we give the word to Simon also. Hi, Simon. Yes, hi. Uh, hello from Venice, Italy. Uh, <coughs> I, um, especially pleased uh, of this occasion you know, as one of Elena's. Uh, institutional interlocutors uh, since uh, her uh, fellowship is based in Venice and Colombia. I wanted to especially, well, first of all, congratulate Elena on her talk uh, and thank uh, Costantina Zanu uh, as the host uh, of the fellowship uh, and uh, a tutor for Elena in this period. And obviously thank Mark for her his wonderful comment. And in the past he had supported uh, previous attempts uh, to try to uh, have Elena at, uh, Columbia University for her work. So we are especially grateful uh, to the, the institution and the great colleagues who have helped us uh, accomplish this project as which tonight uh, uh, becomes uh, 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 very concrete. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm especially excited by the history of idea turn that the project is now uh, acquiring uh, to thank to this, uh, uh, to the connection it has made uh, with the uh, uh, with the, the French context, uh, with Guizot and debates about uh, constitutional rights, etc. Uh, I was obviously very much struck by Mark's comments, and uh, obviously he's uh, uh, well, he's a usual uh, uh, huge amount of knowledge and intellectual power he brings to questions, historical questions in general, but also his Greek angles uh, all, all adds uh, new uh, perspectives. I, I, uh, I don't want to uh, push on it on my Italian pride, but uh, as somebody who's also worked on Mazzini, I was wondering if Elena could elaborate on the ways in which uh, she thinks that the, this Italian experience of political prisoners uh, uh, was, is both interesting in itself uh, as a specific, uh, in its specificity as a, an historical experience, but that would be quite generic. Uh, but also if she could tell us more about the ways in which uh, uh, the Italian experience uh, uh, helped Europe to think about uh, notions of freedom, uh, notions of uh, nationality, notions of, of course, political imprisonment. Because uh, we know that the 1830s, uh, I mean, we know that, you know, nas nationalité is a concept that was not invented by Mazzini. It was, uh, it existed uh, since the 17th century. And uh, as a word, at least the 17th century in maritime law, etc. It existed in the Copé circle and was spread uh, by Madame de Stel in, uh, in her uh, novels and uh, especially in Corinne. But we know that uh, Mazzini in the 30s was somebody who certainly uh, had a central role in, in spreading the idea of, of, of nationalité thanks to the uh, Giovanni Italia and then the, the, the project at least of uh, young Europe. So I was wondering, what is the contribution, the broader contribution that this experience of Italian political uh, 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 imprisonment in this period have uh, for Europe uh, and its relevance to Europe uh, for uh, the circulation of ideas uh, around uh, freedom, nationality, uh, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of political expression. And uh, so once again, um, thank you. And uh, thank I you, Simon. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so I have some questions too, but I will let you address these two issues, Elena, and then we'll come back. So thank you, Phil. Thank you, Simon. So, um, Gizzo, uh, on the one hand, we have to consider that uh, 
these two pamphlets of Guizot, de la conspiration et de la peine de mort et matière politique, were not actually very popular at that time. According to one of his uh, biographies, Victor de Broglie, uh, actually uh, they, were just they were just two editions, so they were not as powerful as other opposition writings that he published in the 1820s. However, um, as Ingram said, the relevance of this concept uh, had a long legacy in um, the historical thought and the juridical thought. For example, the same concept that we can find in the 1830 constitution in, uh, in France actually can be applied in the uh, Belgian constitution of 1831 or in the uh, constitution princ principle of the German people of 1831. So the legacy of uh, Guizot was uh, a long one and uh, everyone that was actually referring and pro promoting a, an improvement of the um, treatment of political prisoners was actually referring to Guizot. From the uh, Italian point uh, of view, I think that the, um, the most important uh, figure related uh, with Guizot was actually uh, Pellegrino Rossi. Rossi in the 20s was in Geneva, but later on in 1834, he arrived in uh, France and it actually uh, was um, the elder of this uh, position as um, it, was, it was the teacher of constitutional right in 1834. That, that, that was actually a position to justify the uh, July revolution. And actually um, Rossi was sharing the same uh, ideas of Guizot. And he was actually uh, saying that um, it was against the excesses of repression for political crimes and question the foundation of uh, power, um, asking if it was, when it was legitimate to actually to, um, uh, to challenge despotism. He actually uh, asked, uh, do we need to resign to despotism? So actually it was not only Guizot, it was a, a broader, um, let's say movement of thought, we can think about the German school of uh, von Chirag, who actually pro proposed the privileged treatment of a political crime because it was not considered a, a violation of the natural order. So it, it was really not only Guizot, it was a broader uh, movement that was actually uh, promoting it. That, now, I, I cannot say anything about the, the Russian revolution of 1825. So I will think about it. <laughs> Probably in another uh, case, I will just discuss it with you, uh, Phil. I've not considered it, but it's really uh, thoughtful and I will uh, think about. And this idea of a broader movement of jurists and intellectuals dealing with uh, political imprisonment, actually, uh, let me think about what um, Simon asked. What's his... Uh, interesting for me is that at that time during the 20s and the 30s actually these uh, political prisoners were considered according to me mostly for their uh, political opinions not for their uh, national identity uh, for example whenever they are discussed they were discussing them in france they were actually referred to the prisoners of venice uh, to liberal revolutionaries and so on and so forth, but actually they became an emblem of Italian nationalism while they were in, in Venice. And that's interesting because the population of Venice actually was able to show them support. While I got some testimonies, some diaries that they say that while they were walking the ward of the prison, uh, the people from Venice actually showed from the windows uh, to the ward some messages and sent them hope or, you know, political messages. And when they were actually released in summer 1832, the population of Venice, in the neighbors where this uh, carcere of San Severo was, uh, was in there, actually they, uh, they got a party for their release. And the guard that were actually um, uh, supposed to control them uh, were, um, let's say, put on trial or at least punished because they were singing the same patriotic song that the prisoners were singing. So actually they became a national emblem while they were in Venice, 
because you know Venice at that time was controlled by uh, a foreign power, so by Austria. But while they were perceived from abroad, from France, they were actually liberal uh, prisoners. And if I can add something else that is interesting to this uh, international networks, so also what Nico Nicolai asked before, uh, actually one of these prisoners while in Venice, these modernist prisoners, was actually able to escape. But the most interesting thing is that the person that was put on trial for, the, for his escape was the, the British consul in Venice. So it was not only a, a question and an issue that was relevant for France, but also from Britain. I haven't yet seen the Foreign Office archives because of the pandemic, but I mean, from the document that I've already collected, also Britain was involved in this, uh, uh, actually in this campaign. So, but at that time was actually more related to liberal issues than to uh, a national um, campaign, I think. Thank you. Uh, that's all very fascinating. You have narrated to me this scene uh, of the uh, of the prisoners walking by. Uh, I mean, uh, going out of prison in Venice, and people having cartellon, you know, with their uh, uh, slogans in this. It's a, it's an amazing scene, I think. Uh, so let me just make a quick uh, two two or three quick uh, questions comments. Um, before other people uh, think of their questions. So one of the things that, um, uh, two things I've already told you, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna repeat here. One I find fascinating is that, the, that you mentioned a woman there, a woman political prisoner. So I was wondering uh, uh, whether, what's the place of women in, in this? Uh, I mean, it's, I find it fascinating that a woman already in the 1830s can be convicted as a political uh, prisoner, like uh, for political crimes. Um, but also I know from what you said that uh, the, 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 the networks of women politically involved around these prisoners uh, is very important. And I wanted you to say two words about that. The second is um, what uh, you mentioned about uh, the political crime be being connected to a specific social status. So I think that the social dimension uh, of how you, uh, the social dimension of redefining morality and, uh, and legal discourse is very important here uh, because it's actually, it, it's really, I think, crucial uh, that uh, um, all these exile, political exiles, all these people, people we have been studying, they mostly come from aristocratic or lower aristocratic ranks, right? Um, they are mostly military men, uh, mean, meaning uh, aristocratic in origin. Um, and so the, you need a different form of legal practice that will judge these people who are not commoners, who are not common prisoners, um, and also who are not, um, let's say, uh, rulers, as in the case of, I was reading a book about the Danubian uh, principalities in the Ottoman Empire, and then you have a different system of punishment uh, for the boyars or the fanariots who are considered uh, traitors of a political, in a political sense. Now, you have these people that really, their social sta status creates a new kind of crime. This is what I want. I wanted to. Now, uh, I have an additional thought coming out from, um, I thought, from, from Mark's uh, comments. I found, it, I found these two points very interesting. Um, one is that uh, somehow I think that the story of the emergence of political crime can be connected to the emergence of humanitarian, humanitarianism and the humanitarian intervention. And what you are um, telling us about this story, it, it, it's a story of, of intervention again, like France intervenes uh, in these various states in Italy in order to, you know, to, to, to um, guarantee uh, the human rights, if I may say. So it's, it's a story which is very much connected to humanitarian intervention. And then, you know, the whole bibliography on humanitarian intervention in, in the Ottoman Empire and the uh, uh, I think it's, a, it's of great relevance here uh, and it can tell you much more about the emergence of this kind of, of political crimes. And the second is, uh, I think memoirs, 
uh, and autobiography is a very important issue. I was, I was, I, I thought not now the first time through Mark's comments that I thought that the emergence of the self in the Romantic period, right, and the emergence of political crime can go hand in hand because exactly you have a person, a personal manner, a, a personal crime, if I may say so. It's like a, per a personal thing. Um, and, 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 and here I come to the, my prisons of, um, uh, you know, uh, of Pellico. When I was teaching this for the first time last year, it, it was the first time I was reading the thing from the beginning to the end. And I was impressed how non-political it is. It's not political at all. It's just a memoir of him being almost a religious figure, whatever, almost saying that the Austrians were right <laughs> by divine right to keep me, him in prison. And so it's very impressive that you have this reading of Pellico all over the world as a political text of a political prisoner. Instead, he wants to present himself as anything else than a political prisoner. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Elena, you can comment so, in the meantime. Yeah. yeah. First of all, women. Yeah, that, thank you for this question. Because I mean, uh, so far I've found few cases of uh, women actually in prison for political reasons. This uh, Bastori Castoni was, was one of the few, but I think that women actually played a very important role uh, inside this story because they were not just um, economic or emotional supporters of the prisoners. They actually played a political role. If I think about the Neapolitan cases uh, of these prisoners kept uh, in prison for 10 years after 1848, uh, that became popular because of these Gladstone letters to Lord Aberdeen of 1852. So they were very uh, famous, but actually it was the wife of Settembrini and the wife of Donno that actually was able to keep, to, um, to keep Settembrini and Donno in contact with politicians outside the prison. So with politicians in Italy and abroad, for example, it was the wife Luigia Settembrini who was al always uh, in contact with the British ambassador in Naples temple, but went also to Turin to speak also to the uh, to the Hudson, to the other uh, British ambassador in Turin. So she was actually keeping in contact and permitting the, um, her um, husband to continue to continue his political activity. So there were actually relevant political figures that were aware of the role of their husband, but are actually playing as uh, political actors in contact with uh, politicians abroad and you know important uh, figures. Uh, so this is, I mean women are very uh, important, if not as prisoners, uh, as, uh, at least as uh, supporters of uh, the prisoners. Uh, concerning the social uh, status, uh, actually most of them were, were belonging to the upper and middle classes. And whenever um, this humanitarian concern was created and supporting their release or a better improvement, it was always referring to their being um, educated people, uh, uh, lawyers, soldiers, so belonging to the upper classes. So the, because of this, uh, a treatment that was uh, compared to the treatment of common criminals was not possible. So whenever they were uh, pleading to their release or improvement of their living condition, they were not considering common criminals that were sharing the same prison, the, sh the same living condition. So it was actually uh, a, a, an upper middle class uh, questions. But uh, it's interesting to know that, I mean, over the century, over the decades, also the social composition of political um, crime changed. And for example, in 1840, after 1848, I can find uh, prisoners that were actually illiterate. They couldn't write and read. So that was also a changement of a change also of the social composition of political uh, mm -hmm. crime, but actually there were the, the emblems of uh, these cases were the important ministers and politicians. They were Pellico, they were uh, Poerio, they were Settembrini. So 
as nowadays we don't know all the Russian prisoners or all the uh, Turkish prisoners, we just know a couple of names that became the emblem of the political case. So it was uh, the same, um, same at also in the 19th century. And I am strongly uh, convinced that this was a humanitarian uh, question. I mean, every time they were um, promoting uh, amnesties or the release of prisoners, they were actually dealing with their physical pain. So uh, it was really uh, a humanitarian question also on the narrative that was uh, used. And this also is related to, um, I think, the idea of the balance of power in Europe. I believe that uh, we can describe this intervention as humanitarian intervention. Uh, in case of Modena, that was not very relevant. But if I think about um, the, 19, the 1850s if for, the, for the Neapolitan case, uh, Britain and France actually broke out the, relation, the diplomatic relations with Naples because they, they promoted an amnesty. And uh, Ferdinand III didn't want to grant an amnesty to political prisoners. That, so they actually uh, stopped the uh, diplomatic uh, interventions. And they actually were thinking also about an armed intervention in Naples, at least you know, in the um, diplomatic papers, they were discussing it. So we can enlist this intervention as humanitarian intervention. And as you said, most uh, research deals with the Ottoman Empire, so to non-Christian countries. I think that the case of the Italian states brings us the idea of the second, third, and fourth rank states within Europe. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the case of Naples, it was, uh, I mean, we know the idea of, um, this colonization, I mean, this uh, the idea of colonization of the southern of Italy, this subaltern uh, represent, representation. So I think this intervention can be enlisted also in the, uh, in the idea of the Italian state as second and third rank, rank uh, powers in which, you know, the great powers were allowed to intervene also in their domestic policies to preserve mm -hmm. the, the peace in, uh, in Europe. Uh, concerning a memoir, yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's the topic that is strictly related to the self and to romanticism. Also because a prison actually was uh, strictly related to romanticism. The idea of self-reflection, of isolation, of uh, the improvement of their living condition. I mean, Prison was one of the emblem of romanticism. And so this helped us this self-reflection that was actually uh, so, uh, so important because actually uh, after their release, these political prisoners continued their uh, political activity by means of their memoir. And it's mm -hmm. interesting how Pellico's memoir was not dealing with politics, but the way it was interpreted and represented it after it was published, it was, as a political uh, book. Also Metternich declared it to be very uh, relevant and very dangerous from the political point of view because it was not speaking about politics in the text. That's so interesting. And also the, the, the literary genre of, uh, mm. of uh, prison writing emerges at that time, I yeah. was thinking. So it's very much connected. So we may have time for another question or comment if you want. I see so many colleagues and friends um, from all over the world here. Uh, otherwise, we have been having this wonderful discussion for one hour and a half. We may as well end it here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you uh, to all for being here. Thank you to Elena and thanks to Mark uh, for the comments um, and uh, have a nice uh, summer. Uh, let's hope post pandemic. <laughs> Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.